Well, thank you, Karen. And before I comment on that song, two announcements for tomorrow. Services are at noon. We'll be opened up by 11, probably 1030. Food, fellowship, uh, services at noon. And then we have a catered meal coming in after services. So that's tomorrow's schedule. What a beautiful song. Don't leave yet. That was beautiful. I trust you. My life is in your hands. And I wanted to wait because I thought, what a segue into this message. And with Chuck's message and how God works things. And how God inspires things. In the times in which we live, that song is so beautiful. One that we all need to, to remember. Our life is in his hands. I was talking to Bruce last night and it was like, and I mentioned it here before the COVID or as it was coming on. Walk by faith, not by sight. Don't walk by what's around you. Don't walk by what's happening around you. What's going to come upon this world and the nations in the coming years. Walk by your faith. Walk by your commitment to Jesus Christ and our Heavenly Father. Remember your calling. And that's what I want to talk a little bit about today. Not only our calling... But in the midst of all the things that are happening and will happen, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And that light is glimmering. It's shining. And it's shining especially for those that are filled with that hope within them, that are filled with God's Holy Spirit, that are filled with the joy of the salvation that He has given us. You didn't earn it. You didn't pay for it. You didn't buy it. It was given to you at no cost. He said, come to me. Come to me. When he called you. Remember your calling. There's some in this room called 50 years ago. Some in the last year. Some months ago. Some 10, some 20, some 30. And everything in between. Remember that calling and the glorious future that God has planned for you in the coming kingdom of Jesus Christ, the coming kingdom of God, the coming kingdom of our Father. Each baptized member of God's family is a miracle. A miracle took place. For some of you it was husband and wife. That's a double miracle because that doesn't happen all the time. But a miracle took place in your life. Don't ever lose sight of it. Don't ever take it for granted. Don't do an Esau and just give it away. Hold on to it. Hold it dearly because your whole future depends upon it. Your whole future. Each one of us. I want you to think back. Think back to the time that God pricked your heart and he began to draw you toward him. And he began to open your mind to all the lies and deceptions you were brought up with. Everything that you were taught, your parents didn't know any better. They're teaching you lies. It's the truth. You know it. I know it. We've all been there. We've seen that. Whether it's tooth fairies, Santa Clauses, everything out there that you can imagine. They were lies. Deceits. Things that are idolatrous, that are totally against God and his ways. Things that he didn't intend for his creation. Because each one of his creation, the objective, the goal is to become a part of the God family. And each one will be called, each one in their own order, in their time, when God calls them. He set that time. And it's his right. He is the creator of all things. God, God's word refers to each individual when they're called being illuminated. A light came on. And when that truth was given to you, the light began to come on. Hebrews 10.32, you don't need to turn there one verse. Hebrews 10.32 says, but recall the former days. Remember them. Remember your calling. Remember who you were before you were called. Remember what God has done to you as he brought you out. Remember the former days in which after you were illuminated, 
you endured a great struggle with sufferings. And many times the enemy comes after those that are first baptized, comes after those that are being called, tries to pull them away. Just as the parable of the sower illustrates, the word was sown. We didn't call God. We didn't come to him on our terms and say, I'll do such and such if you. God called us on his terms, as he does each individual at their time. John 6.44 says, no man can come to me. This is Jesus Christ speaking, his words. No one can come to me except the Father. The Father, the Eternal Father, the Holy One. The great God in heaven has sent, uh, which has sent me, draws him. And I will raise him up the last day. The resurrection. There was something he saw in each one of you. There was something that he saw, and you answered that call. And now we have to hang on to that. You're on that roller coaster. Don't jump off. It's pretty dangerous. You'll break your neck. You're going to have to stay on and stay the course because it's a lifelong commitment. And just like our sister that was just buried just last week, this last week, she has that victory, and she hung on till the very end, and she wanted to be here with each one of us today, but she is in and has entered into her rest, and we miss her, but she fought that fight. She fought that with a conviction, with her love of the truth, her love of God, as each one of us must do. 1 Corinthians 1, if you want to turn there a few verses. You know, we need to remember with God's calling not to get puffed up. Because there wasn't anything that was so special about us. But there was something. You know, I don't want to take it too far, but there was something. God knew that you would answer. He knows the beginning from the end. Or the end from the beginning. That was a gray moment. <laughs> I was testing y'all. Sharpen up. All right. For you see your calling, brethren, how not many wise men after the flesh, me, not many mighty, me, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish. He chose the foolish to confound the wise. He chose what was weak to confound those which are mighty, that his strength can shine through, that his strength can shine through us. And he chose the base things of the world Things which are despised has God chosen. And things which are not to bring to naught those which are. That no flesh should glory in his presence. And when we come before his presence, we know that it's only through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, and through his broken body that we can come to the holy of holies before the Father himself. But of him you were in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us, who has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. What beautiful words. What beautiful words God has given us. And it reminds me of when God called David 
when he was looking for that man to be king after Saul, because Saul didn't stay faithful. Paul fell by the wayside, fell into his own. He didn't trust God. He didn't keep looking to God. I'll do it. You remember the stories. And God looked for a replacement. 1 Samuel chapter 16. We're just going to go through a couple verses, but just want to bring to our mind, just like these scriptures we just read that God looks... He chose the foolish to confound the wise. He didn't choose the mighty. He didn't choose the noble. He didn't choose the prime ministers, the presidents, the senators, any elite that you want to think of, the billionaires, multi-billionaires. He chose the foolish. 1 Samuel 16, beginning in verse 6. So it was... I better... So it was when they came that they took Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature. This is the oldest brother. Because I have refused him. See, Samuel's thinking, This is the one. This, look at this man. This is the one. And God says, No. It is not. Don't look at his outside appearance. Don't look at his stature because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. See, God looks differently, brother. Just as he looked differently when he chose and he called each one of us. He looked differently. But the Lord looks at the heart. And see, that's where something special was in you. That God seen something in your heart, just as he did David's. David was a man after God's own heart. He loved God. He stumbled. He stubbed his toe. He made some mistakes. He fell short. Just as each one of us does. But he had a love for God. He kept fighting the fight. He was a repenter. He would go before God and repent, and he meant it. He wasn't proud of his sin. See, God doesn't look on the outside stature. He doesn't look at your height, your strength. He doesn't look at your possessions, whatever you have, how wise you think you are. He looks at the heart, and he chose the foolish. Our Father makes the weak strong. He makes the foolish wise. And he gives hope to the hopeless. And he gives a kingdom to his children. He has a plan for you. He's preparing for you. And what he's preparing is a glorious future that aren't words I can give you to give the glory to God for what he has planned. Jesus said in John 14, beginning in verse 2, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, and I go to prepare a place for you. A special homecoming awaits his children. A special homecoming. I remember just a few weeks ago when we were able to first meet after this pause with this COVID-19. It was like a reunion and the hugs and the joy and the smiles being with God's people. Just like this weekend, this special weekend, Pentecost weekend. For those that were able to be together in our hearts, we think about those that couldn't be. We wish they could be here. We miss them. We wish them well. But it's so good to be together. But there's a great special homecoming waiting at the appointed time. And if I go to prepare a place for you, promise I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Called to be kings and priests, 
to reign with Jesus Christ in this Sabbath day. It's not Pentecost that looks to Christ's return, the establishment of his kingdom. I'm not illustrating that. I'm not trying to bring that up in, in this message today. The Sabbath refers to and points to that millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Peter said a day is as a thousand years in prophecy. We're about 6,000 years in right now. That last 1,000 years, the millennial reign of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That is the light at the end of the tunnel. That is what we're looking for and longing for and what we're supposed to be praying daily for. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done. And I just want to reference, and we'll go through it. I've referred to this scripture a lot uh, lately, but I think it's so important because we need to have the same attitude that Abraham had in Hebrews 11, verse 10, for he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God whose builder and maker is God. That's where our hearts have to be. And we have to walk by faith and not by sight with all the things that will come upon the nations of this earth. Because when it begins to truly come, it will be like labor pains. And it's going to come quicker, faster, and more intensity. The intensity will be ratcheted up. God has a wondrous plan for mankind. They just don't even know it. They don't know the love that God has for all mankind. Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world. He didn't say just for the called, just for the elect, for the sins of all mankind. Because it's not God's will that any would perish. His will is that they would all come to the knowledge of the truth, that they would all repent and become his children. Paul was inspired to write 1 Corinthians 15. Of course, that's the resurrection chapter. Just a a few verses there. Let's be reminded. Beginning in verse 51, Paul wrote, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, For the trumpet will sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal should put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying, it is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? Just dropping down to verse 57. Thanks be to God which gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Have you really thought through and thought about the depth of incorruptible? And what he's referring to there. That you are going to be incorruptible. The dead in Christ will raise first. And those which we which are alive will meet him in the air. And will be changed. And the scripture says we will be like him. Those of us that are getting a little older, we know that our bodies are quite temporary. You know when you're in your 20s, you're in your prime, feeling good. I had Neil come help me the other day. We're unloading the truck. Young buck, those two, he's taking two cases of 40-pack waters, and I think those are at least 16 if they're not 20 ounces. They're heavy. Two of them, Down the stairs he goes. There's two more sitting there. I bypassed him. I grabbed a box. Okay. I said, I was good once. He goes, you probably were, Steve. (laughs) But my point is, we're so strong. You know, we're, we're in such good physical shape as long as we have our health. And that is nothing compared to what God is going to give you. There's some here that had a lot of aches and pains and surgeries and And, uh, you know, just getting up each day sometimes can be a challenge. The old knees hurt. I'm coming down the stairs yesterday. I'm like, why my knee? My wife, she's seen the knees. We've all seen things, at least the older ones. The young ones go, ah, life's great. But we're going to be changed, brethren. 
We're going to be given a body that will never weaken, a body that is filled with strength, that is filled with power, that is filled with vigor. And as Tom brought out in that one message recently, it might have been over the feast, about John the Baptist, the least in the kingdom will be greater than John the Baptist. Wow. He was quite a man, filled with God's spirit. We're going to be spiritual. We're going to be like our Father and Jesus Christ. There won't be any cancers. There won't be any colds. There won't be any sickness. There won't be any disease. We go through this prayer list. It just breaks your heart. It will be gone for all those that are changed. And it will begin to change upon this earth as the curses are taken away. As the soil is restored back to what God intended it to be. You, brethren, have the greatest future ahead of you. We have to remember it. We have to keep the vision. It's not just words. It's the promise from our Father, God Almighty. These aren't my words. You look back, I think it was Bruce the other night, we got talking about Israel that came out of Egypt and all the miracles they seen and how they turned away from God, how they murmured and complained. They seen all these things in Egypt. They seen how the Egyptians were plagued, plague on top of plague, but it didn't come nigh thy dwelling. It didn't come near their homes. It didn't come near their children. They were protected. And when the firstborn, their children were protected, the blood had to be upon the doorposts and the lintels. And God protected them. A miracle took place. And they forgot all that in days. And you know the story. And you know about the promised land that they were going to be given. It wasn't going to cost them anything. Other than there was an enemy in there. They had to get through some things, some challenges of life. Oh no, they didn't trust. They didn't trust. Forty years they walked in the wilderness. God said those generations would die. Only Joshua and Caleb, the only two. And you read about those two. They had a zeal. They had a love. They had like that first love. And I love it when I get around someone with a first love. They're just on fire. And, and you know what? It rubs off. And I like that. We need more of that. We need God to bring more in. Help us keep that fire stoked up and remember what that first love's about. To not be falling asleep and just, you know, going through life. Because it's so easy to just go through life. Life is so busy. There's so many challenges each and every day that just take us away. And we have to get focused and regrouped. And we have to try. I've thought a lot about that first love this last week. We need it. We need an infusion. That's what we need. First love. Remember those promises. Be strengthened. Be encouraged. Remember what God has for us. What the big picture. You know, the day to day on this earth, that's not the big picture. That's just a temporary. It's a time. There's things we're to do here. We can be a, a light, and seeds can be planted. We talk about that innumerable multitude and planting those seeds for that many that will come out, that maybe you can impact their lives. But God has for you the greatest future. You've already been sealed. Any individual that has repented, been baptized, received the Holy Spirit of God Almighty is sealed to the day of redemption. You are sealed. And the only way you can change that is if you walk away. If you give it away, like Esau gave it away. It's an example for us. That's why it's there. Don't give away your birthright. Don't give away the wondrous promise God has given you. Well, I want to get back on track because I've only got... I, I didn't check the time when I started here and I don't want to go crazy. And I've got half a book here yet to go. It doesn't matter. You know, you really try, and any speaker, we try to follow God's inspiration. And God, 
That's what we look for. That's what we want. That's what we pray for. Don't let the words be my words. Fully born of God Almighty. The completed new creature. You see, because right now it's like we're in the womb. We haven't been fully born yet. We're his child. And we just haven't been fully born until Christ returns. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I'll just read a couple verses here. Starting in verse 13, he says, Brethren, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning those that have fallen asleep. Unless you sorrow as others who have no hope. See, many in the world, they don't have any hope because they don't have the understanding that God has given us. They don't know. For if we believe that Christ died and rose again, even so, God will bring him with him those who sleep in Christ. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep, which is just what Paul was talking about, uh, the church in Corinth. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet them in the air. And thus we will always be with the Lord. We will always, from that time forward, be with our Father in Jesus Christ. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. These words should bring us comfort. The promises of God should edify us and strengthen us and encourage us and uplift us. And we will return and usher in the kingdom of God Almighty. The book of Jude, just a couple verses there. Beginning in verse 14. And Enoch, also the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed. Now, I'm not going to go through all that, but the point is, we're going to teach them. You're going to have a listening ear. Today, they don't want to hear. They don't want to listen. And occasionally, you'll get someone with a question. But for the most part, people don't want to hear. They don't want to know why you do what you do. Because it would require them to change. And most don't want to change. But you're going to be teachers, brethren. You're going to have responsibilities. The kingdoms of this earth, the strongholds of this earth, are going to be brought down. And we will help usher in the kingdom of Almighty God. We will usher in that kingdom. The nations will no longer learn war. The war drums are beating today. If you're listening, they're beating. And as Tom mentioned a couple years ago, the Cold Wars, Cold Wars turn into trade wars, which turn into military wars many times, not always. The nations will no longer learn war. Satan will be bound, and he will not deceive, and the people will listen, and the people will learn, and the children coming up, what beautiful life they're going to have during that millennial period. Here you're going to have who knows how many thousands of God's children that are going to be there, that are going to be the leadership, that are going to lead with love, that are going to lead with mercy and kindness and gentleness, all the fruit of God's Holy Spirit that we will just automatically have because that's who we will be fully like him. How many millions have died over the last 6,000 years in wars? How many mothers have had to, and fathers and families have had a military member come to their door and tell them their son or daughter lost their life?
there won't be any war anymore. There will be peace. The war machines will be destroyed and changed, changed into agricultural equipment, things to be used for the good rather than for evil. Micah 4. Let's take in some of these words as we bring this message close to a close. Micah 4, beginning in verse 1, It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills. Those mountains, those hills represent kingdoms. It's typology. God's kingdom will rise above all kingdoms. And the peoples will flow into it. And many nations will come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the eternal, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths. He will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths. It won't be any more You can keep whatever day you want to. And sorry for all those that believe the law is gone, and I know this group doesn't, but you never know when someone's going to listen. Out of Zion, the law shall go forth. What law? The law of God Almighty. All of his laws. And the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he will judge between many peoples and rebuke strong nations afar off. And they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. And nation will not lift up sword against nation, nor shall they learn war anymore. But everyone will sit under his vine and under his fig tree. They'll each have their piece of land. They'll have their fig tree. They'll have their crops. They'll have their work. And no one will make them afraid. Today we've got to lock everything down. Lock it up. You've got safes. You've got locks. You've got dead bolts. You can't trust anything anymore. There's some here that probably remember a day that you could leave the doors unlocked. It wasn't a big deal. Neighbors help neighbors. Times are changing. And God said it would. We know that. And that's why we see what we see. For all people will walk each in the name of his God. But we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. In that day, says the Lord, I will assemble the lame. I will gather the outcast and those whom I have afflicted. And I will make the lame a remnant and the outcast a strong nation. And so the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from now on and forever. A time of healing. A time of healing of the nations. A healing of the peoples. Physically and emotionally. They're going to have been through an awful lot. Those that survive what's going to come upon this world. They're going to need healing. They're still physical. We will be the spiritual, and we will help with that. Isaiah 9, just a couple verses there, verses 6 and 7. You see, we have a hope, brethren, and we have a glorious future ahead. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon the kingdom, to order it, to establish it, with judgment and with justice henceforth even forever. And the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. A couple chapters over in Isaiah chapter 11. And there will come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch will grow out of his roots. 
This is referring to Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And the spirit of the eternal shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he will not judge after the sight of his eyes. He won't judge according to the appearance, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor and we reprove with equity for the meek of the earth and shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. Is there justice in our land today? I say there's not. If there is, it's very little, very little. And what happened to that man in Minneapolis should have never happened. I don't care what the skin color of anyone shouldn't happen to any man or woman. It's utterly ridiculous. And it just breaks my heart to watch that video and people coming by and talking. He's hurting. He's bleeding. He can't breathe. They're trying to warn the officer, get off him. He's dying. Three other officers there, and I don't need to get into all of it, but it just shouldn't be. It is not the way it's going to be in the kingdom of God Almighty. That kingdom will be ruled with love. There will be justice. The balances will be fair. And you won't be listening to a false accuser. And people won't be misjudged. Righteousness will go forth throughout the nations of this earth like they have never before. Never in all the history of mankind other than Jesus Christ himself teaching Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. But with righteousness he will judge the poor and reprove with equity the meek of the earth and he will smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked and righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins and faithfulness the girdle of his reign and talking about those wondrous promises this beautiful creation that has become an utter mess will all be changed even the nature of animals will be changed our little three-year-old well, will be three next week little uh, he's two today Carson our grandson Sandy it's the, the opportunity to watch him during the week and she talks to him quite often about God's coming kingdom and what beautiful promises God has and how the children will be able to pet the lion. He loves that. I'm going to pet a lion? I get to pet the lion? Yes, you'll get to pet the lion. And the wolf, all those you think are bad are going to be pretty good. Imagine getting on one of those big grizzly bears. They'll be pretty nice then. The wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid and the calf, and the young lion, and the fatling together. And a little child will lead them. You know, God has to love the children. He talks, you know, Christ talked about the little children. Suffer them not to come before me. And he touched them, and he blessed them. And what a wondrous time that Christ will lead, and we will help lead. And see these little children, the generations coming up that they can enjoy God's beautiful creation and learn his ways of love. And the suckling child will play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall play, uh, put his hand on the cockatrice's den, and they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the eternal as the waters cover the sea. That's why he says, no more will they say, you know, Lord, Lord. They will all know him from the least unto the greatest. And in that day there will be a root of Jesse which shall stand as an ensign for the people. Jesus Christ, his banner will be raised. King of kings and Lord of lords and his brothers and sisters there with him.
He tells us in Isaiah 30, Blessed are those that wait for him. Blessed are those that wait. Isaiah 30, beginning in verse 18, says, And therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto you, and therefore will he be exalted, that he may have mercy upon you. For the Lord is a God of judgment. Blessed are all they that wait for him. Blessed are they that sigh and cry, that pray with a heartfelt, earnest feeling, Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done. For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem, and you shall weep no more. He will be very gracious unto you at the voice of your cry, and he shall hear it, and he will answer you. What beautiful words. I need to bring this to a close. Just a couple more scriptures. Jeremiah 3, verse 17. At that time, Jerusalem shall be called the throne of the eternal, and the nations shall be gathered to it, to the name of the eternal to Jerusalem, and no more shall they follow the dictates of their evil hearts. No more shall the peoples follow the dictates of their evil hearts. We get to be a part of this. We get to be those that are the restorers of the breach as we work with our elder brother, the King of Kings, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, because all things must be restored before the Father will be a part of that. It will all be turned over to the Father once it's restored at the appointed time. Daniel 7, verse 27, And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High, they will be given to the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. It will never end. And all dominions shall serve and obey him. We have a glorious future that lies ahead, brethren. A glorious future is in store for those who will overcome. Those who will work to overcome. Those who will be faithful till the end. We are to remember our calling. We're to remember what God has done in our lives and what he's doing in our lives and what he will do in our lives. We're to remember that he delivered us from that spiritual bondage of sin. And he imparted within us his spirit, that earnest, that down payment. Remember the special calling that he has given you because it's a personal relationship between you and him. You don't come before a minister or another person to go to the Father. You go to the Father. Your relationship is between you and him and Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Men will let you down. We don't put our eyes upon men. We don't, you know, look at them... Uh, in a wrong way as far as putting them up on a pedestal. We don't worship an individual. We worship our Father in heaven and his Son, Jesus Christ. We need not be wearied. We need not be troubled by the things that are happening in this world. We need not be like Lot. His soul was vexed. It took a toll on him. He loved God. God's word said he was righteous. But it took a toll on him, and that's why he had the problem with the alcohol, because it took a toll on him. He didn't want what was happening in the world around him. He didn't like the sin that was all around him. He didn't want to be a part of it. And he loved his wife, and they were there, and they had daughters, and they had other, you know, grandchildren. Hard to leave all that, you know. We need not be troubled. This world is not our world. This is Satan's world. And he is the God of it. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4. And he has created much of the chaos and confusion in this world. Along with the deceptions and what you will see in the future. And God's people need to be strengthened now. This isn't my message today. But it just 
comes to mind and heart, they will be de deceptions and lying wonders. And the world is going to wander and worship the beast. That's what's coming in God's time. But the clouds are on the horizon. And that's what we see. We need our hearts prepared. We need to be like a Joshua and Caleb. We need to be filled with that first love, with the Spirit of God Almighty. We need to stoke the fire. There's one of our hymns, and I think there's a scripture that says, Rekindle the fire. What was it? Second Timothy. Paul told Timothy, Stir up that gift within you. Stir up that spirit within you. And I call on each one of us, all of us, stir up that gift. We are the children of the Most High God washed in the blood of the Lamb. We are strangers in a foreign land. And what awaits us, what awaits each one that in, has been sealed in God's Spirit within them, what awaits you is the most glorious future. And it goes way beyond what we touched on today. That's just, a, that's, that's just going into the millennium. That doesn't go out beyond the last great day and what God has planned beyond. Let's encourage one another. Let's pray for one another. Pray for God's protection. And pray that each one of us remember that first love. Remember the promises. And hold on to what God has given us and what he plans to give us. What we have now is just, just the down payment. May God bless each and every one of you.